Good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to the final day of the 33rd Regulatory Information Conference. I'm Andrea Vale, Acting Director of the Office of Nuclear Reactor Regulation and co-sponsor of this conference, Ray. And I'm Ray Furstena, the Director of the Office of Nuclear Regulatory Research and the other co-sponsor of the RIC. We hope you've enjoyed the conference so far and we've got a great lineup planned for our final day. So we're gonna get started, Andrea. Since this is our last morning preview, can you believe it? I'd like to take a moment to thank you all for attending the RIC from around the world. Yesterday, we mentioned that we'd love your feedback on this year's RIC. I encourage you to give us that feedback as we continually seek to improve the RIC. If you'd like to provide feedback now while the RIC is still fresh in your mind, you can find a link to the survey on the NRC's RIC webpage under the program tab. In addition, in the coming days, all attendees will receive an email with a link to the survey. Either way, we'd love to hear from you. And I'd like to thank the entire team that made the RIC possible, from our RIC core team to our support staff and contractors and all of our panelists and speakers. We couldn't have done it without you. And, and Andrea, of course, it's always a great pleasure working with you, too. Yeah, it's been a joy, Ray. You're a great partner, so thank you. I also second the thanks to the team. It took a lot to be able to do the virtual RIC, and this year was truly historical. It was an exercise in innovation to pull off a conference of this magnitude in a 100% virtual platform. It was one year ago today that the WHO designated COVID-19 as a pandemic. To be able to pivot and be, have a successful virtual RIC is truly remarkable since planning for the next RIC in normal times begins right after one RIC ends. I also truly enjoyed Commissioner Wright's video yesterday it was very creative, heartfelt, and memorable. And the way he provided his remarks really stuck with people. There was a lot of love in the comments for how it made people feel. And ultimately, that is what's most memorable per, per the famous quote by Maya Angelou. I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. I also want to spend just a few minutes highlighting yesterday's morning sessions. In the session on microreactors, the panel talked about how emerging markets are defining a role for microreactors in diverse applications across North America. The panel also explored the drivers for microreactors and government plans to support them in non-traditional roles, such as providing power in remote locations like Alaska. The panel also talked about potential impact of the drivers on the licensing and authorization of nuclear facilities. Now this is from your office, Ray, the ideas new human reali reliability analysis method session. That's a mouthful. The speakers introduced the new suite of human reliability analysis methods. And this is the remarkable part. It was built entirely by the NRC staff to handle all nuclear applications. It is called the Integrated Human Event Analysis System. The applications include in-control room, X-control room, diverse and flexible coping strategies, otherwise known as FLEX, fuel cycle, medical applications, et cetera. The session promoted the use of these enhanced ways of analyzing human events in the nuclear domain. The audience also learned about the development, validation, and testing of the methods. Attendees learned about the ease of use of methods and their applicability to everyday nuclear applications. The Emergency Operations Center session was unique in that it talked about how different agencies have set up their emergency operations centers to respond to all hazards. It touched on the specialized products needed to respond to an accident at a nuclear power plant, and the session also discussed recent changes to the NRC's incident response program. And finally, the Waste Management Symposia, or WMS, and the NRC Information Exchange simulcast, which is a great example of the benefits of a virtual platform. Many of the RIC attendees also normally attend the WMS conference and vice versa. So the simulcast was a first and allowed the two groups to exchange information. Ray? Yeah, uh, Andrea, uh, I really enjoyed Commissioner Wright's uh 
plenary as well. And but uh, as with all the commissioner plenaries, we had we didn't have enough time to get to all the questions. But but uh, there was one question that we didn't get to with Commissioner Wright's plenary that I I, I wanted to bring up for him to ponder a bit. It, it, the question was, uh, which is harder for you, reviewing? Um, uh, papers before the commission or, or catching a squirrel in your mother's house. So uh, I'll leave that one for, for <laughs> Commissioner Wright. Uh, you know, we, the afternoon sessions we had, uh, uh, the technical sessions, uh, they were, uh, you know, all, all really good. I was uh, chairing a session on space nuclear power systems uh, to Cislunar and Beyond was the title of it. And we had some great external speakers from DARPA and NASA and DOE and and my, my only regret is we didn't have about another hour to uh, have a discussion and answer questions. And I think that was the same way for all the sessions. The, there was, a, I know Chairman Wright chaired a session on the evolution of the U.S. electric grid. There were lessons learned from the, uh, the implementation of risk-informed initiatives in the Virginia uranium versus Warren. Uh, what's the Supreme Court's decision mean to interim storage? So... It was, it was a, a really great afternoon, I think. Andrea? Now I have to correct you, Ray. Um, Rocky the Angry Squirrel and his compatriots lived to see another day. Commissioner Wright did not kill any squirrels. He got them out of the house and they were taken to a sanctuary, I believe. Yeah. So I want to make sure everyone understands that Commissioner Wright didn't kill any <laughs> For our final day, we have two plenary sessions focused on special topics. Of course, today, marks the 10th anniversary of the Fukushima Daiichi accident, and the morning plenary session will reflect on the event, the safety journey taken by the international nuclear community, and its impact on the future use of nuclear technologies. Ray? Yeah, it, all of us, I think uh, March 11th, uh, 2011 was, was one of those days where I think all of us all never forget where we were at at that time. I, I recall I was uh, working for the Department of Energy at the time in, in Idaho, and, and I recall a uh, meeting with some researchers and engineers at the Idaho National Engineering Lab that, that Friday, and, and the whole discussion revolved around how, how can we help as a, as a nuclear community? How can we help? How can we help Japan? So I think... Uh, I wanted to bring on now uh, uh, Nathan San Filipino, and he was uh, he was involved in some of the initial response from the NRC uh, for the for the Fukushima event. and And Nathan, can you share uh, your recollections from that day? Sure, thank you, Ray. Uh, it's truly hard to believe that ten years has passed since March eleventh, uh, twenty eleven. Uh, like many of the NRC, my NRC colleagues involved in the response and lessons learned activities over the past decade, today's anniversary sparks many emotions and memories, both the anxiety, heartbreak, and helplessness of those days, but also the camaraderie, teamwork, and dedication to help our Japanese friends. On the morning of March 11, 2011, I was serving as an executive technical assistant to our executive director for operations. We started each day with a morning staff meeting at 7.45 a.m., and it was the day after the 2011 RIC had just ended. In what might have otherwise been a drowsy Friday morning, the conference room TVs were showing live coverage of the earthquake and tsunami, which had occurred in the overnight hours here on the East Coast. We were tracking tsunami warnings that might impact the NRC's licensees in Alaska, Hawaii, and the West Coast. Word was starting to spread about challenges at the Fukushima site, uh, but as you all know, early details were scarce. While we continued to monitor the news for information, we carried on with our work days and trusted in the robustness of the safety systems and design of the reactors to mitigate any challenges. That evening, a few hours after my workday had ended, I got a call to report to the NRC Operations Center. Like many other NRC staff who support our incident response organization, I had been through dozens of trainings, drills, and exercises. But when I found myself logging into my computer in the NRC Ops Center that evening, I didn't know what to expect. We had very little actionable information other than what was on the TV news. But as the teams assembled at the NRC headquarters, we were united in our desire to do anything we could to help. As the accident began to progress more rapidly that evening and we received more information, our leadership began working with the rest of the US government to send expertise and resources to Japan. In those late night hours, I recall our leadership looking amongst those assembled in the Ops Center for staff who had valid passports and could pack a bag and be at the airport in a few short hours. At one moment, a fellow colleague and I were approached with that very question. 
My colleague, Jim Trapp, was a former BWR licensed operator, so his expertise was perfect for the task. And within a few hours, we were seeing Jim off with his dissymmetry in hand, wishing him luck. I was a member of our liaison team, working with many US government and nuclear industry partners to communicate about the event and coordinate US technical aid. I remember many consecutive night shifts here on the East Coast, which were of course the daytime hours in Japan, on conference calls with the US Pacific fleet discussing potential contamination of Navy vessels, talking to TSA counterparts about the radiological screening of passengers arriving on US flights from Japan, and daily updates with our team that had arrived at US Embassy in Tokyo. After several weeks of that battle rhythm, I was honored to have been selected to be part of what came to be known as the Near-Term Task Force, the six of us NRC staff who would be sequestered in a tiny conference room for the next three to four months on the mission to learn all we could about the still unfolding event and to make recommendations regarding any potential safety enhancements needed for U.S. nuclear plants. While I have many, many memories of those three months with the task force, I was inspired by the team's unifying goal to ensure, of ensuring that the hardships and challenges the Japanese were facing would never have to be repeated. In fact, my task force colleague, Dan Dorman, now Deputy EDO, will be moderating today's Fukushima discussion. I'm proud to say in that rereading re and reflecting upon our report now 10 years later, that it's held up very well, especially since it's, it was published only four months from the day the accident began. Obviously, a lot of deliberation transpired in the weeks, months, and years after the report that ultimately led to the March 2012 safety orders, the systematic reevaluation of flooding and seismic hazards facing U.S. plants, the innovative safety enhancements provided by the U.S. Industries Flex Program, and now all U.S. nuclear plants are safer and more prepared for the unknown. It is an honor to serve at the NRC, and March 11, 2011 is a day that is forever etched into my personal and professional memory, and I'm really looking forward to hearing from the outstanding panel at the morning session. Back to you, Ray. Yeah, thanks so much for your remarks, Nathan. We really appreciate you joining us for the discussion this morning. Um, today's afternoon's uh, special plenary is titled, uh, See the Change, Be the Change, Energizing the NRC Workforce, and will feature discussions from NRC staff on enabling change, recruitment, retention, and diversity and inclusion. Andrea? As usual, we'll also have two sets of concurrent technical sessions covering a wide range of interesting topics. Today's morning technical sessions span the topics of analytics, machine learning, and AI, chaired by Commissioner Barron. Projections and thoughts of what the current nuclear fleet will look like in 2050, chaired by me, and foreign policy for nuclear export licensing, right? Yeah, uh, Andrea, the afternoon technical sessions, they span the topics of economics of nuclear power, the use of technology to support regulatory decision making, reactor decommissioning, and digital instrumentation and control. And I wanted to feature uh, one digital exhibit uh, today, and that's called uh, Fulfilling the NRC Mission Today and in the Future. Uh, this digital exhibit highlights the future of the NRC and is sponsored by our Office of the uh, Chief of Human Capital. Uh, you'll definitely want to check that one out. Andrea? Yes, and if you haven't had the time to check out the digital exhibits, if you go on the conference platform, it is a link in the opening um, screen for the platform. Please take the time to look at them. They do have a lot of great information, and we've been very busy with technical sessions. But please take the time to look at the digital exhibits. We've highlighted, I think, every day a different one. We talked about, in the first day, we talked about the um, four virtual rooms for the uh, potential future based on uh, external drivers. We also highlighted the OPA session, and I highlighted Embark Venture Studio. So again, this is a plug for the digital exhibits. We know people work very, very hard to, to get those together, and we hope that you look at them. Yeah, they're all worth a look. Thanks, Andrea. You're welcome. And now I'm very pleased to welcome Chairman Hansen, who will begin our special session on the 10th anniversary of the Fukushima accident. Good morning, and welcome to the final day of the RIC. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to welcome you and a panel of very distinguished speakers to this special plenary session to commemorate the Fukushima Daiichi accident. Today, 
marks a decade since the Fukushima accident, initiated by the great Tohoku earthquake and subsequent tsunami. Although I was not part of the commission in 2011, I am keenly aware of the profound impact of this day on the Japanese people and the extraordinary work they and the government of Japan undertook in the aftermath of both the natural disaster and the Fukushima accident. The strength and resilience of the Japanese people were demonstrated countless times in response to the disaster over the last 10 years. Sadly, over 20,000 people perished. In honor of those who lost their lives in this tragedy, please join me in a moment of silence. Hello to all of you gathered for this important conference. Every Japanese has his or her own memories of the day 10 years ago exactly, when the earthquake and tsunami hit. I was working in Tokyo at the Foreign Ministry as Deputy Director General of the North American Bureau. I saw things moving on my desk. I saw the concern on people's faces but up in Tohoku, much more deadly and serious things were happening. I don't need to list the dis Thank you. Honoring the accident at Fukushima is not just looking backwards, it's learning from it and moving forward. The impact of the accident on the United States and the global nuclear community has been profound. The NRC, nuclear regulators worldwide and international organizations have worked diligently to share information and implement the lessons learned to enhance global nuclear safety. Implementation of the lessons learned has differed around the world. I recognize that each regulator and nuclear operator has its own unique set of circumstances to contend with. But these lessons learned have been implemented with the same goal in mind, increased plant safety. I firmly believe that due to the actions taken by the nuclear community worldwide, operators have a greater ability to mitigate future beyond design basis events. However, we must remain vigilant in our nuclear safety activities. While I'm confident in the actions the United States has implemented to enhance nuclear safety, I remain dedicated to continuing to ensure the US reactor fleet fully implements, maintains, and exercises those measures required in the aftermath of the Fukushima accident. I will conclude by noting that engaging in the type of dialogue we will hear in this session and throughout the RIC is key to continuing to ensure we remain cognizant of global nuclear safety practices that can inform and strengthen our respective regulatory programs. I look forward to hearing from this session's respected panelists as they reflect on the Fukushima accident and share how their respective organizations will continue to implement the lessons learned in the future, as well as their thoughts on the accident's legacy on nuclear plant safety. I'd like now to direct your attention to a video message from the Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary of Japan to the United States of America, Koji Tamita. Hello to all of you gathered for this important conference. Every Japanese has his or her own memories of the day 10 years ago exactly when the earthquake and tsunami hit. I was working in Tokyo at the Foreign Ministry as Deputy Director General of the North American Bureau. I saw things moving on my desk. I saw the concern on people's faces. But up in Tohoku, much more deadly and serious things were happening. I don't need to list the destruction that occurred. As I told a group the other day, I saw the support that the US sent it was a moving thing to witness. 
all the service members, the aircraft, the ships, the disaster aid coming together in this arsenal of friendship. We feel deeply appreciative. For the accident at the Fukushima Daiichi power plant, the US government dispatched responders from NRC, DOE, the White House, OSTP, and also the US Navy. A decade has since passed and the reconstruction is making visible progress. The decommissioning of Fukushima Daiichi has also progressed, but it will take 30 to 40 years to complete the process. It will require tremendous efforts as well as international cooperation. The government of Japan is proceeding with the decommissioning with transparency based on scientific evidence and with support from international organizations like IAEA and OECD NEA. I would also like to recognize the process that's been made in communications between regulators and operators around the world to enhance nuclear safety. For example, the Japan Nuclear Regulation Authority was established in 2012 and just last year, in 2020, it introduced a new safety scheme modeled on the NRC's reactor oversight process to clarify the responsibilities of regulators and operators. Today's panel discussion is another opportunity to share the lessons learned as we increase nuclear safety going forward. Thank you for the work you are doing and my best wishes to you all. Thank you, Chairman Hansen and Ambassador Tamita. Good morning, afternoon, and evening to you all. My name is Dan Dorman. I am the Deputy Executive Director for Reactor and Preparedness Programs for the NRC, and I have the privilege to be the session moderator today. As we go through the session today, please feel free to ask any questions that you may have using the Q&A session on the feature on the right side of your screen. And as we get toward the end of the session, we, we will answer as many questions as time allows. At this point, I'd like to begin introducing the panel members for today's discussion. Uh, Shuichi Kaniko is the Director General for Oversight, International Affairs, and Fukushima for the Nuclear Regulatory Authority of Japan. Following the accident 10 years ago, Mr. Kaniko had the role to coordinate governmental countermeasures at the Crisis Management Center in the office of the Prime Minister of Japan. He also participated in the preparations to establish the new regulatory body in Japan, which is now the Nuclear Regulatory Authority, where he holds leadership responsibilities. So I welcome Director General Kaniko and thank you for joining us today at the end of a very long day in Japan. Juan Carlos Lentijo is the Deputy Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency. Uh, he joined the agency in 2012 and in 2015 was appointed Deputy Director General and Head of the Department of Nuclear Safety and Security for the IAEA. Prior to joining the IAEA, Deputy Director General Lentijo served with the Spanish nuclear regulatory body starting in 1984, and from 2003 to 2012 served as the General Director for Radiation Protection. Deputy, De Deputy Director General Lentijo, thank you for joining us today and welcome. Uh, William Magwood IV is the Director General of the Nuclear Energy Agency in Paris, France. Uh, he was from March 2010 until August of 2014, a commissioner of the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission. He has extensive experience in both the regulatory and developmental aspects of nuclear energy, including at the international level. And while a commissioner of the NRC, he advocated the importance of nuclear regulatory independence and the necessity of maintaining strong, credible, and technically sound nuclear regulation in all countries that use nuclear power. Prior to joining the NRC from 2005 to 2010, he provided independent strategic and policy advice to US and international clients on energy, environment, education, and technology policy issues. And from 1998 to 2005, Mr. Magwood was the director of the US government's civilian nuclear energy program at the US Department of Energy. 
Director General Magwood, welcome and thank you for joining us. And finally, Admiral Robert Willard, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Institute for Nuclear Power Operations. Admiral Willard was elected President and Chief Executive Officer of the Institute of Nuclear Power Operations in 2012. Prior to that, he had a distinguished career in the United States Navy, beginning as an F-14 aviator. He served in a variety of fighter squadrons aboard several aircraft carriers, rising to command the nuclear-powered aircraft carrier USS Abraham Lincoln. As a flag officer, Admiral Willard twice served on the Joint Staff, was Deputy and Chief of Staff for the U.S. Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, commanded the Carrier Group 5 aboard the USS Kitty Hawk, and commanded the U.S. 7th Fleet in Yokosuka, Japan. In March of 2005, Admiral Willard became the 34th Vice Chief of Naval Operations, and in May of 2007, he assumed command of the U.S. Pacific Fleet, and in October of 2009, he became the Commander, U.S. Pacific Command. He retired from the Navy after a distinguished career in 2012. Admiral Willard, welcome to the session and thank you for joining us today. I appreciate each of you agreeing to participate today as we mark the 10th anniversary of the accident at the Fukushima Daiichi Nuclear Power Station. Each of us were involved in one way or another, either directly dealing with the immediate effects from the accident or striving to learn the lessons to make the safe use of nuclear power even safer. So first, I'd like to take a brief look back at 10 years ago, where we were, what we were doing, and any reflections on that event. In March of 2011, I was a senior manager in the NRC's Office of Nuclear Material Safety and Safeguards. And during the first week after the earthquake and tsunami, I led the executive team in the NRC's response center here in Rockville, supporting a team that we sent to Tokyo that you heard about earlier from Nathan, and working with US stakeholders to develop strategies to, for sustainable cooling at the reactors at the plant. On March 18th, I was asked to go to Tokyo to support the US ambassador there and to engage our Japanese colleagues who were valiantly striving to address the challenges at the plant. Upon my return to the US in early April, as you heard from Nathan, I was privileged to serve as a member of the NRC's near-term task force tasked with identifying early lessons from the accident. The objective of that task force was to conduct a methodical and systematic review of relevant NRC regulatory requirements, programs, and processes and their implementation, and to recommend whether the agency should make near-term improvements to our regulatory system in response to the events in Japan. Many of the actions taken in the U.S. over the last decade, which have been discussed in various plenary and technical sessions throughout this conference, find their roots in the work of the near-term task force. At this point, I'd like to turn to Director General Kaniko and ask you to share, sir, your reflections of, of what you were doing in March of 2011 and the days that followed. Thank you very much, the chairman and the coordinator. Uh, good morning, everyone and uh, gentlemen and uh, ladies, and also good afternoon and good evening. First of all, please let me say thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to join the session. And also, I'd like to express my gratitude to NRC for a huge amount of support after the accident to recover at the dis disastrous situation and reinforce our regulatory framework so far. And also, my appreciation is not only to NRC, but also to the uh, international colleagues uh, joining this session. Um, in response to the question from Dan, um, there are many lessons from the, our early stage of the uh, response. Uh, of course, um, um, the first one is uh, the things not prepared is not operable. So those are the quite important things we learned. However, uh, based on our, my personal experience from the early morning of the second day of accident. So the confusion was actually mess in, even in the uh, center of the, uh, our government uh, crisis center, crisis management center. And um, information 
sharing and uh, uh, control uh, lines are really important. So the kind of um, lines and of course the, the situation of the command incident system is quite important to respond to the kind of catastrophe of the situation. So that is one of the um, prepared situation for the command incident command line, such such like uh, like such things. So this is our and my uh, great reflection uh, from the uh, first two or three days of the accident. Thank you very much for the question. Thank you, Director General. I, I want to turn for a moment to Admiral Willard. Uh, you were the commander of the U.S. Pacific Command. You were responsible for uh, U.S. forces stationed in Japan uh, during this time. And so, uh, sir, I'd welcome your reflections on your experience at that time. Yeah, thank you, Dan. And, and uh, thank you for uh, having uh, me at the RIC and, uh, and uh, greatly appreciate the effort that all of you have made to make this uh, regulatory conference so successful this year, uh, albeit uh, from remote settings. Uh, when the earthquake struck Japan, I was uh, in my headquarters in Hawaii. Uh, it was uh, a work day for us and, uh, and in the afternoon. The tsunami and, um, and typhoon center for the Pacific is located at coincident with the U.S. Pacific Fleet Commander. So we were immediately notified uh, that the earthquake uh, had happened and that a tsunami warning was uh, in effect. And from my office, uh, I have very profound memory of, uh, on television, the tsunami uh, waves lined up heading toward northern Honshu. And in addition to uh, our concerns for the Japanese people, obviously, in the path of all this, and having uh, been struck by the earthquake, the United States uh, military has about 50,000 service members in Japan alongside their families. Uh, so our tasks were uh, immediately to determine what impact the disasters uh, may have had on, uh, on the service members and their families that were in the country. Um, but as the uh, tsunami unfolded, our concern um, uh, really shifted to the forces that we had in the area uh, that we might access to bring to bear and offer to uh, General Ariki, the Chief of Defense of Japan, in support of uh, what were inevitably going to be his efforts in search and rescue and, and so on. Uh, and ultimately, it was a carrier strike group, two amphibious ready groups, and many of our commands uh, in Japan that uh, became the supportive element for General Ariki uh, going forward. Uh, in all, we supplied over 20,000 troops that included ships and aircraft uh, that operated in and around the tsunami-stricken region. Uh, to include in support of the uh, of the Fukushima Daiichi accident, uh, we were able to bring to bear many technologies, including uh, intelligence uh, technologies that could uh, help to characterize uh, the uh, the disaster area. Uh, to include uh, the Fukushima Fukushima plant. And uh, once I was able to break away from my commitments to keep uh, the Pentagon and the White House informed of things. Uh, my wife and I flew to Japan and uh, joined the ambassador and his spouse for a tour of the tsunami stricken region. And I would tell you that the uh, destruction uh, that, the, that the Japanese people were contending with was indescri indescribable. Uh, and we ultimately met with some of the survivors and, and, uh, uh, and it was heartrending to see what had occurred in, uh, in Northern Honshu uh, and over the next several weeks, it was really um, uh, the focus uh, was uh, for us uh, had shifted to uh, the support for General Ariki's forces and the Fukushima disaster itself. 
Uh, and I would tell you that there were countless lessons that we learned through all of this. Um, it was a profound experience, uh, and you know, both for uh, us in command and for uh, the troops on the ground. Ultimately, we were uh, decontaminating ships and aircraft and personnel uh, through uh, all of this. So again, uh, many, many uh, lessons learned for uh, the U.S. Armed Forces in this and for uh, the Japanese Defense Forces, uh, a, a remarkable situation. Thank you, Admiral. Uh, let me turn to Director General Magwood. You were on the commission here in Rockville at the time. Uh, would you share your, your memories and reflections of those early days of the event? Yes, Dan, and it's good to see you. You're an excellent public servant, and it's been a pleasure to serve with you and to see you again. Uh, let, let me just begin by congratulating Chairman Hansen and all the NRC team for putting on uh, such a fantastic virtual RIC, uh, particularly Ray and Andrea. I know how much goes into doing this, and I think you just did an extraordinary job this year, so congratulations. Um, when, when I think about this period, um, I actually think about the day before March 11th. I think about March 10th. And I think about March 10th because it was the last day of the RIC, and it had been a long day. And my very last meeting on March 10th was a very long, very technical, very detailed, very late meeting uh, with the Japanese um, Nuclear Safety Commission. And they had come to tell us about all the great work that had been done in Japan uh, to prepare for potential earthquakes at nuclear power plants. Mm -hmm. So we had a lot of analysis they were showing us, and tools they had developed. They were very proud of this. And um, we spent more than two hours going over this with them. So I went home. I was very tired. I went to bed. Um, and so when I woke up the next morning, the very first thing I heard was news about the tsunami. And... Um, my immediate reaction, of course, was the rush to the office, but I wasn't thinking about anything nuclear. I was thinking about all the friends and colleagues I have in Japan, and I tried to reach people. And, of course, communications were terrible. You couldn't reach anyone. Um, and my staff and I were watching the situation unfold, uh, watching the horrible images of the tsunami. And I, I think it's, it's, it's important, and I'm glad that Chairman Hansen highlighted this, to remember that the true tragedy of 311 uh, was not necessarily the nuclear acts, but really was a tsunami and the 20,000 people lost um, from that terrible tragedy. And I, I think that sometimes gets mm -hmm. forgotten over the period of time uh, in many places. Um, but it was later that morning we started to hear about problems at the Fukushima Daiichi plant. And, of course, um, the more we heard, the more concerned we became, and it started to take our attention. And, and it's really fair to say that uh, Fukushima Daiichi has held our attention really for the last 10 years because there has been so much that has come from this. Um, mostly, mostly lessons learned that we have absorbed around the world to improve nuclear safety, but also some recognitions that perhaps there were some things that we had not quite understood about um, the whole nature of operating nuclear facilities. And I think that some of it worth just a recognition about the vulnerabilities that come from the human aspects of nuclear safety. Uh, something I think we all understood, we all knew about safety culture and the importance of training, but I don't think we fully appreciated um, how instrumental um, the decisions made on a daily basis can mount up for a nuclear facility. When you look at the Fukushima Daiichi facility and the decisions that were made over the course of years, um, not, just, not just during the incident, but really in the years before the incident, choices that were made um, that perhaps were not fully reflective of safety culture, um, how that mounted up over a period of time to create the situation that we saw. And that includes uh, decisions made by the regulatory body. Um, you know, we, we recently at the NEA issued a new report I'm looking at how to manage the, um, the strength and safety culture regulatory bodies. And this is work that's come out of this whole incident, recognizing that if, if, this, if the regulator, the operator, um, all of those involved don't do their utmost to maintain a high level of safety, 
the vulnerability still exists. And it doesn't matter how good your designs are. It doesn't matter how much equipment you have on site. So the people aspect remains very important. I think we realize that. But my recollection, of course, is, is, is really more about the tsunami that first day than the nuclear facility. But, of course, as I said, the facility sort of took over from that point forward has been our attention for the last uh, decade. Thank you, DG Magwood. Um, let me turn now to Deputy Director General Lentijo from International Atomic Energy Agency. You were not there yet at this time 10 years ago. Uh, share with us, please, sir, where, where you were and what were your impressions at the time? Thank you, Dan. Firstly, thank you so much for inviting me to this panel with uh, the company of these very distinguished uh, colleagues and professionals. Well, uh, I was uh, on my way back from Washington to Madrid uh, after attending the RIC conference. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, it was a very long day for me because uh, in the evening of uh, Thursday, uh, 11, uh, 10, uh, uh, 11th, uh, uh, I, I, I had my flight to return back to Madrid, but it was delayed. And then, uh, well, it was delayed when I arrived in, uh, in London, where I have a connection. I missed my connection to Madrid, mm. and I was in a waiting area, uh, looking, uh, uh, watching several TV monitors, where I can see, I could see a lot of images about a disaster in Japan. And some of them included uh, a nuclear power plant, but it was not very clear what uh, what was uh, happening with this uh, nuclear power plant. When I arrived in Madrid very late in the in the in Friday uh, on Friday, uh, well, it was uh, it was amazing because uh, I received immediately a phone call from the emergency center of the Nuclear Safety Council. I was an officer of the Nuclear Safety Council, the, the regulator in Spain. And they told me, they informed me that uh, 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 an accident, a nuclear accident was ongoing in Japan at uh, Fukushima. Uh, well, uh, they told me, well, you need to be ready to, to, to attend a meeting immediately in our emergency center where we will uh, prepare our strategy to deal with that. Okay, I was extremely tired because uh, my journey was for more than 20 hours. But then I attended this meeting where they informed about the, the accident. And of course, this started, this triggered a crazy time where I had to attend uh, hundreds of meetings with uh, Spanish uh, authorities, with the government, with the embassy of Spain in Tokyo, uh, with, uh, I don't know how many interviews with the media, etc. What were my first uh, thoughts? Uh, well, let me tell you. My first thought was, of course, that I was very worried about the impact of, uh, on human life from the earthquake and tsunami. At that time, we didn't know what was the uh, scope of this nuclear power plant accident. And in fact, my first thought was, well, this is a boiling water reactor. I know very well this technology. Um, uh, I was sure, uh, I assumed that the, that the accident was under the uh, design basis accident envelope so that my initial thought was okay through the appropriate systems and procedures the the, the accident won't progress and they will recover but uh, unfortunately this didn't happen and the, situ the situation as you will know evolved dramatically and very rapidly towards the three uh, reactor core uh, meltdowns and the hydrogen explosions. This uh, was very shocking for all of us, for all the professionals in the nuclear community. And then we started to follow this. Uh, I will mention now, uh, uh, following the, the information coming from the emergency, incident and emergency center of the IAEA. At that time, at the very beginning, the information was a little bit chaotic. It was very difficult to understand what was uh, happening. I should recognize that they will, they were, they were very active in promoting uh, uh, an improvement in the uh, format and uh, information that they share with us. So that uh, uh, through this information, we were very conscious that the accident was very serious, and uh, I was invited to participate in the first uh, fact-finding mission that was conducted by the agency to Japan, uh, it was impressive. This was an impressive experience. I had the chance to see firsthand 
the degree of destruction, uh, not only uh, offshore, but uh, especially on site the, uh, 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 the nuclear power plant. Uh, well, as you can imagine, we saw these uh, reactor buildings were uh, totally destroyed. Uh, many tanks were displaced, uh, and uh, with uh, some cars were on the top of the tanks or on the top of the buildings. It was uh, it was really really uh, amazing this experience. And my feelings at that time were very very clear. I, I saw that uh, the Japanese uh, had created some very robust uh, uh, centers to deal with these catastrophes. For example, they have this uh, seismic isolation center that was the on-site emergency center that was very robust and survived. Then I had a, a, a thought that was, well, this is not only about Japan. This is not only about technology. This is mainly about persons. This is mainly about people, workers, uh, working to mitigate the accident. And this is mainly about the, the, the international community of nuclear. We need to, to do our best to support Japan uh, and to support ourselves in dealing with this uh, with this uh, accident. This was my my initial thought. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Director General, Deputy Director General Lentijo. Um, so as we come from the the immediate time and in the the crisis to bring stability to the the plant, uh, then we we begin to focus to all of you have mentioned the need for for change the need to learn from this uh, and so let me turn back to director general kaniko uh, starting starting in japan uh, could you just touch on the most important changes uh, that have that were you, you learned were needed and you, that you have implemented over the last decade thank you very much dan um I'd like to emphasize two things. Okay. The first one is the importance of the uh, continuous improvement of, uh, of safety. So as a regulator, uh, we are likely to, not likely to, but um, we are, have the tendency to uh, satisfy uh, the current situation of the safety. However, the, you know, um, not estimated situation is coming in the not estimating future. So the continuous improvement of safety is really uh, Im important. There is a sort of Japanese saying, natural disaster comes when we forget it. This is the saying from the uh, famous Japanese physician, uh, Horahiko Hirada, who is um, maybe the 100 years ago uh, physician. So this is our very uh, important and the fundamental uh, lesson from the uh, Fukushima Daiichi accident because we did not change, uh, we didn't change the uh, regulatory standards about the uh, coming tsunami or the earthquakes at that time. Uh, even the new uh, knowledge is uh, pledged in the uh, academic field. And, if, and even to us and also to the licensees, those are somewhat, um, you know, the, the, the thrown away uh, for the, uh, in, in the safety field, from the safety field. So this continuous improvement of safety is the one. And, and, of and the other is the impact of the common cause failure in terms of the safety, uh, safeties and security is really a critical, has a critical impact to, uh, the, uh, to, to secure the uh, safety and also uh, to, to be prepared for the accident. So in terms of the uh, redundancy and also diversity of the countermeasures are uh, really key to um, protect the facilities and also the operation of the uh, safety and security uh, 
uh, operation. Uh, so the common cause failure is always have to be in mind and the priority and the impact of the common cause failure is the, uh, the first one uh, in the real, uh, current uh, safety uh, issues. Those are the two major l lessons learned from the uh, Fukushima Daiichi accident. And uh, actually we uh, changed the regulatory framework to incorporate in the, uh, into our uh, regulatory standards and the regulatory requirement uh, to have to prepare for the common cause failure, and also we can incorporate uh, the new uh, knowledge and new findings into the uh, current uh, regulatory standards to be required. Thanks for the question. Very good, thank you. Uh, let me turn back to uh, Deputy Director General Lentijo. So as, as, sir, as you make the transition in 2012 into the agency, you have most of the last decade uh, at the agency. And, and I know there's been a tremendous amount of work at the agency, both in the areas of uh, nuclear safety standards and uh, applying the lessons from the accident and also uh, applying the lessons into the peer review services of the agency uh, to strengthen the the global nuclear safety. If, if you could just expand on those and, and perhaps share some examples. Yeah, thank you. Well, firstly, as you will know, the most important instrument that we put in place after the accident was the so-called uh, action plan on nuclear safety. That was an instrument to promote uh, not only uh, through the agency, but through our member states, uh, work together to strengthen, in, to strengthen in nuclear safety globally. And um, I could say that uh, the distillation of this uh, work was this, uh, this uh, Fukushima report that you all know very well. This uh, report uh, was prepared by, uh, by a group of more than 180 professionals, very the highest professionals in the different disciplines. And uh, it was prepared in a very systematic way. That means that we collected the wisdom of the best uh, experts in the world for uh, for putting together this uh, this uh, this uh, report that described the accident, the safety implications, radiological implications, etc. And the most important is that uh, it uh, through the through the report uh, there are uh, a good uh, collection of uh, let's say uh, lessons learned to be implemented. There is no rank for the lessons learned. That means that uh, uh, they are uh, spread ar uh, along the document as uh, it is uh, split into different chapters. But some of them are very technical. Some of them are related to the improvement of the, let's say, site selection or the site uh, the, uh, impact of external events, methodologies, etc., etc. But some of these are mainly aimed to the root cause. I concur 100% with uh, with uh, Mr. Suchi Kaneko, that uh, the most relevant uh, uh, area here is uh, is um, uh, uh, safety culture. But the, the most important message from the from the nuclear safety action plan and from the report is that okay, we identify lessons, but please lessons are not just to put them in a in a book in a very nice book. They are to they are uh, to be uh, acted upon and implemented in a real way because there is no room for uh, complacency in nuclear safety. Uh, the, we have emphasized that the safety first principle is of paramount important, uh, importance. And behind the safety first principle, we have the safety culture. And we need to be sure that we promote the real integration of the safety culture uh, uh, along all the organizations dealing with nuclear safety. And uh, for doing that, it is obvious that uh, the, it, it, uh, there is a need of commitment, there is a need of uh, definition of processes and procedures, there is a need for training. All the staff are called to participate in the safety culture, to identify in a very active way problems and to, and to seek uh, solutions. But it is mainly about leadership. So that all our activities at the agency has been moved to promote the uh, leadership and uh, safety culture uh, along all organizations. If you allow me, uh, we promoted a reflection of our main uh, think tank in nuclear safety, which is INSA. You know all very well that we have INSA that was created after Chernobyl accident. 
by the way they promoted an insect uh, publication about safety culture. This time they prepared uh, uh, this uh, insect 27 document which is uh, about ensuring robust national nuclear safety systems, which is a reflection on the role of the different institutions involved in nuclear safety in really promoting a strong uh, nuclear safety framework in a country, including regulators, but including operators and including other institutions, mainly the governments, to provide the appropriate resources to the regulators, etc. So uh, this is my main, uh, let's say, uh, uh, thinking about uh, our distillation in the agency. Of course, as you mentioned before, we have improved uh, many safety standards. Uh, we are still working, uh, we improved all the requirements. We are now working with the safety guys. And maybe you allow me something which is important is that we need uh, all of you in your countries uh, perform what the, in Europe was called the stress test, you know, the parts you, you created the task force, etc. And it was obvious that you impacted the, this uh, nuclear safety dramatically. But which is important is to build the future and to sustain this for the future. In my view, this is only sustainable through the real integration of the safety culture principle. Very good. Thank, thank you. Uh, let me turn back to uh, DG Magwood. Uh, so you, you made the transition from the NRC to NEA and, and uh, you, you lead a lot of uh, multilateral efforts. Uh, you, you mentioned your report on safety culture. Uh, what other works have NEA uh, engaged in looking at the lessons of the accident? Uh, anything else that you'd like to bring forward? Sure, thank you, uh, Dan. For well, certainly there's been a series of reports looking at the Fukushima accident. Um, the NEA reports have, have been less about the accident itself. I think the IAEA did a very good job of capturing the, mm -hmm. um, the technical aspects of the accident. We, we focus mostly on um, how people have reacted to the accident. And, and most recently, we released um, a report called Fukushima Daiichi, uh, nuclear power plant accident, 10 years on progress, lessons, and challenges. We just released it last week. And this really looks at the progress that's been made um, both at the site and cleaning up the site and around the world to incorporate these lessons, but also looking at the challenges that lay ahead. And um, it's actually quite interesting to see how many challenges still are before us at this, at this point in time, um, including um, further work in the area of safety culture. Uh, Juan Carlos mentioned this, I mentioned this, others have mentioned it. Um, and I was not, and you probably don't remember this, Dan, but I was not really fully bought into the whole safety culture discussion when I first came mm -hmm. to the commission. Uh, Fukushima Daiichi completely changed my perspective on this. And I see safety culture as maybe the single most important issue um, that faces nuclear power going forward from a safety standpoint. Um, Another area that's very important to think about is the regulator itself. And I mentioned our report on the safety culture of the regulator. But when I was a commissioner, um, I spent a lot of time going to Japan, talking to senior officials, talking to DAI committees about why the NRC was such good regulator and what do they need to do to bring that culture of, a, of, a, of an independent regulator to Japan. Um, we got into a lot of detailed conversations about how do you train people, how do you develop the staff, um, should you have a commission or a single administrator. We had all those conversations. It was really very, um, very, very powerful to, to re reflect on that. Um, but when I look at the report that we just issued, something that really comes to mind for me is that the decisions that were made in the heart of the crisis on protective actions to evacuate people, um, immediate decisions made um, towards um, assuring that uh, people were not exposed to radio radioactivity. Um, many of the decisions had long-term implications that, quite frankly, um, to the crisis. But years later, we now see, and our report reflects this, we now see that these decisions um, had a lot of impact on the society, on the individuals, and I think this is now a thought process that we have to incorporate into our thinking on protective actions. Not just protecting people immediately, but protecting people in the long term. And that, that's something I think that we have to reflect on. Uh, one final thing I would highlight before um, you know, moving on is that one regulatory issue that has arisen from this, I won't say an issue, it's a challenge, 
is that regulators are now in the midst of essentially regulating beyond design basis events. Um, to me, this is the biggest single change from a regulatory standpoint that's occurred um, in the last 10 years. This, this is not what regulators used to do. And now regulators are basically giving a lot of specific guidance um, on what to do in case of a severe accident, how to recover from the severe accident, how to prevent severe accidents. And um, this changes the game uh, for regulators around the world. And uh, this is something that we're still sorting through, still understanding. And it'll probably be many, many years before we fully understand what the implications are. Good, thank you. Uh, let, let me turn to Admiral Willard here. So, so sir, you, you came over to INPO, and, and INPO has a, a fairly unique role in the United States. We've heard about the importance of the safety culture and the regulatory body, but INPO is an industry-driven organization that drives beyond the regulatory minimum, drives for excellence. Um, and so I'd welcome your thoughts as you've led uh, that organization through the last decade uh, of the lessons from Fukushima and how that has shaped the work of INPO and the, the uh, performance of the U.S. nuclear fleet. Yeah, thank you, Dan. I think if there was uh, one word that uh, would sum up the lesson learned from, uh, from this uh, very profound disaster, it would be uh, prevention. On the, on the part of uh, the nuclear industry. And, uh, you know, when you, so part of that uh, prevention was uh, the work that the NRC undertook following uh, the accident in terms of uh, having our industry re-examine uh, its beyond design basis physical plant to ensure that flooding hazards and uh, and other natural and, and or man-made disasters could be contended with. Uh, and I think the flex strategy that the uh, industry undertook uh, and invested heavily in uh, is also part of that preventive measure that uh, would have, uh, have us avoid uh, an accident like this um, in the future. And, and, uh, and so prevention is truly what um, I think has, uh, has, you know, been the, the single you know, most uh, uh, profound approach uh, that uh, I think both of, both the NRC and INPO have undertaken. Uh, but there were many lessons from, uh, from the accident at Fukushima and, uh, and INPO published uh, a series of INPO event reports and they ranged from uh, the technical uh, aspects of this particular accident to the leadership aspects. And I guess uh, the final comment I would make is the importance of leadership in crisis uh, to be effective and uh, the need for our industry to be uh, made up of strong leaders that uh, can lead in normal times, but more importantly, can lead uh, when uh, crises develop. And, and to put my uh, commander's hat back on just for a moment, um, you know, when I look at, uh, at what we contended with in Japan following uh, the tsunami and uh, as the Fukushima accident grew in proportion, um, the, the chaos that existed uh, in the area, the uh, level of misinformation uh, that was uh, being communicated uh, in the public domain, the, the uh, challenge to decision making. Uh, across the government and, uh, you know, in support of, of what had happened at the plant. Um, all of that had been affected by this overwhelming disaster that had taken place. And if we zero in on, uh, on the site itself, um, I was struck uh, during this entire uh, engagement with uh, how isolated TEPCO and the site seemed to be from the rest of the nuclear power industry. And I would like to believe that at a time when a site needs mutual support uh, from its industry members, uh, we would always have it in the future. And, uh, and I think we take great pride in the United States with regard to the amount of mutual support that's uh, evident every day across our industry. Uh, and it's especially key in crises like uh, like this one. 
Thank you, Admiral. I, I appreciate the focus on pre on prevention. I, I, a number of uh, our panelists have touched on the scope of the disaster in Japan, well beyond the nuclear issue. Uh, and I know my impressions from the weeks that I spent in Japan in March of 2011 uh, were largely of uh, communities 150 miles, 250 kilometers from the plant that had been completely destroyed. Uh, and and the scope of, uh, I think somebody touched on the, the 20,000 or so that w lost their lives from this disaster. Uh, there were millions without water and without power. Uh, and they didn't have homes that had their basements flooded that they would go back to and dry out their home. Their, not only their home, but their entire community was destroyed. And that, cut, that backdrop uh, just impressed upon me that in a disaster, in a natural disaster that puts a nuclear power plant at risk, the uh, civil society has so much more to deal with that it's essential that the nuclear industry is able to keep the reactors safe. And I observed that the, the operators that remained at both Fukushima Daiichi and at uh, Fukushima Daini, uh, both were dealing with challenges from the tsunami, uh, and they knew what they needed to do. But they did not have the equipment and the procedures available to them. Uh, and so they were, they were scrambling. They, they were uh, working very hard to, to, re to restore stability to those plants. And at Fukushima Daini, they were able to do so. Uh, and at Daiichi, they simply ran out of time. And so it's that that I took back to the NRC's near-term task force and, and uh, the recommendations that ultimately became the U.S. Industries Flex Program. Uh, and in fact, uh, we haven't mentioned it here today, but the, the Flex Program includes uh, two response centers uh, in Tennessee and Arizona that will provide backup equipment. So we have equipment at the U.S. nuclear power plants, but then there is backup equipment that can be delivered to any plant in the country within 24 hours to make sure that the operators have the resources that they need to prevent the disaster outside the plant from becoming a disaster inside the plant. So thank you. Thank you all for your, for your thoughts on that. We are getting some questions from the audience. I, I'm going to turn first to uh, Director General Kaniko. Uh, there is noted that there was a fairly significant seismic event off the east coast of Japan last month. Uh, and any updates you can give us on the conditions at the Fukushima Daiichi? Yeah, thanks for the uh, opportunity to explain that kind of situation. And actually, February 13th, we have a quite large earthquake in the Fukushima area, uh, which was a less magnitude uh, earthquake, uh, but uh, uh, the vibration at the surface of the land was just a little bit smaller than the 10 years ago. And um, in the Fukushima Daiichi site, the kind of stack pile of the containers, which stores uh, solids, uh, slightly radioactive substances are uh, sort of cl collapsed. Um, and the tanks containing water after the treatment of the radioactive material removal are slightly moved in the several uh, locations. And also water level inside the primary containment vessel uh, in the unit one and three has been slightly decreased. Those are the sort of effect, but uh, um, the cons consequence of the uh, radioactive pollution or the uh, effect to the environment is uh, not uh, detected. So the, the, the consequence is very, very small. So th that's a kind of uh, uh, update for, uh, from the uh, February's uh, earthquake. Good, thank you for that update. Uh, Director General Magwood, uh, in looking to the future, uh, what is the NEA doing to help implement lessons about understandable radiation protection standards and the health effects of both low-dose radiation and the impacts of the fear of low-dose radiation? Oh, well, th th those are challenging issues, and we're dealing with them as best we can. I think the first thing we've started to do is we started to um, work with the um, organizations that fund low-dose research around the world to coordinate their efforts um, so that they don't duplicate um, their research, so that they magnify the effect 
of the work that they do uh, pursue to try to understand um, the science behind low dose radiation, which is very difficult. But also we are taking a real leadership role in pushing the optimization agenda. Um, this is something that um, is very complex. It, it is a, a way of looking at regulations um, in the context of society and making decisions, not just simply based on um, the doses, but recognizing that perhaps in some cases, a little more dose is, is better if in the long term it benefits society. So we're looking at those sorts of issues. Um, they're going to be very complex in this long conversation. But one thing that Fukushima Daiichi did is it created um, a global dialogue among all the regulators and all the operators, the like of which we've never seen before. And so we do see this conversation taking place on a global basis. And it's very satisfying. Good. Thank you. Uh, and, and as we shift our focus to the future, I, I know we have about five minutes left. Um, Deputy Director General Lentijo, uh, in a recent IAEA bulletin, DG Grossi indicated the IAEA will be hosting a conference on the international uh, conference on the decade of progress after Fukushima Daiichi. Can you give us a preview of that? Yes, uh, of course. Uh, Initially, um, for, initially, we planned this uh, uh, conference, a uh, high-level conference, to reflect, to promote ref the reflection on what happened in Fukushima, but mainly to project ideas for the future, to continue contributing to strengthening nuclear safety globally. It was planned to be uh, held uh, around the 11th of March this year. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, the pandemic situation uh, prevented us to do it because uh, we reflected and we prefer to to try it uh, with some uh, presential in person in person conference to facilitate some networking. It's not only about uh, uh, conference panelists or conference speakers to say things, but also to promote networking. So that the idea now is to move uh, this conference to November this year, where we cross our fingers and uh, uh, expect that the situation will, would have been improved. And uh, I insist that the, so far we have already uh, uh, a lot of time between the 8th and the 12th of uh, November this year. And the idea, I insist, is to build on the lessons learned and to, uh, and to prepare the system to continue, uh, let's say, uh, facilitating exchange of information, which is our main role, to facilitating our services and especially to facilitating uh, 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 places for dialogue and for re common reflection and promoting nuclear safety. So that I invite you, uh, I think that the, your, your chairman, uh, uh, Christopher Hanson, is uh, one of the uh, members of the special committee that uh, we put in place to, to prepare this conference. And I am very, very, very confident that the conference will be really implemented in November, maybe as not only in person, but maybe hybrid so that we will have also others, not only people coming to Vienna. And I attach a great, great, great relevance to this conference, as we mentioned before, to, to facilitate building a better future. This is one of the instruments that we try to put in place to leverage what we have learned in real implementation of safety improvements or safety to be strengthened. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, so in the, in the very short time we have left, I have a quick question for all of our panelists. Uh, there, there is a lot of conversation about climate change and the demand for power uh, and the need to reduce carbon and the role of nuclear in that. And in that context, there are a number of countries that have not had nuclear power that are seeking to develop programs for nuclear power. And as you reflect on the le lessons from the Fukushima accident, uh, what's the key message that you would give to a, to a country that is establishing the infrastructure to build a nuclear program? And I'm going to start with, with you, Direct Deputy Director General Lentijo. Well, thank you. Yes, it's obvious that uh, nuclear can play a role in uh, helping the humankind dealing with this very difficult uh, situation. My, my insight is very simple. I think that we have learned. And now we have uh, uh, nuclear power plants which are, who are, uh, which are uh, safer than uh, they used to be in, in the past. And if you remember one of the uh, things that uh, the community did, the contracting parties of the Convention of Nuclear Safety, was to put together their ideas and they, 
uh, uh, they, uh, let's say, adopted this uh, Vienna Declaration principles, firstly, to, to encourage uh, uh, the designers and the community to design safer nuclear power plants, but there is also a very strong commitment in upgrading the existing fleet of nuclear reactors and to, uh, uh, towards the same objectives, to prevent, uh, let's say, uh, large accidents with large uh, consequences. And the third uh, uh, criterion, uh, the, the third principle in this Vienna uh, uh, Declaration uh, uh, on nuclear safety is very important because you know that our safety standards are not mandatory for countries, but through this principle, there is a very clear encouragement to the regulators, to the authorities, to the operators in the in the countries to use our the agency safety standards as uh, as, a, as a benchmark uh, to to prepare the national regulations. So that, in my view, uh, nuclear has uh, learned and is ready to continue uh, promoting safer uh, facilities for a safer uh, world and contributing to the cl climate change uh, 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 countermeasures. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, DG Magwood, a quick thought? Sure. <coughs> well, I, 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 I think I've learned that while there are new technologies coming, there'll be some very interesting innovations with small reactors and micro reactors and Gen 4 reactors. Um, it, it, come, it comes back to something I said earlier, which is it comes back to the people. So I, I, don't, I don't think that the technology, the modifications matter as much as having um, a well-trained workforce um, that works in the right kind of culture with the right leadership, to echo Bob Willard's very uh, pertinent remarks, um, but also with an independent, strong regulator that has resources to be able to oversee. I think if you have those elements, safety is in pretty good shape. If you don't have those elements, it doesn't matter how good your technology is, you're going to run into problems. And so that's the focus I would put on these newcomers. Uh, get the regulator right, get the culture right, train your people, develop leaders, and, and you'll be fine. Great. Thank you. Admiral Willard? Uh, I would offer how important it is to learn from the past. And... I, I think the, uh, this opportunity that the, uh, the NRC has taken to bring uh, Fukushima lessons forward is a good example of that. Um, having uh, taking, taken on those lessons, as, uh, as all of us did in the international nuclear uh, community, uh, we have made ourselves more resilient. Uh, and, it's, uh, and it's frankly a set of lessons we can never forget. So, uh, so regardless of new technologies and the opportunity to build resilience into our future reactor designs. I think so long as we keep the lessons of the past before us, we'll be uh, much better prepared to deal with uh, beyond design basis situations or any situations that we're confronted with going forward. Great, thank you. And for the final word, Director General Kaniko. Thank you, just one word. Um, learning from other countries' experience is very important. Not only the safety, the research activities, operational experience, engineering achievements, and other aspects surrounding nuclear energy uh, should be taken into account for each country's determination. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to thank everybody who has stayed with us. We're a couple of minutes over, uh, but I want to thank every member of the panel for taking time out of your very busy and important schedules and, and sharing your thoughts with us today. This concludes this uh, Fukushima anniversary plenary session. Thank you. Thank you very much.